The Duas originally was formed by, um, as, a, as a local um, university club um, by Jan Vincent Rudski and Stephen Payne. Um, it then became a national organisation about a year later and I and Gordon Blows and Jeremy Bentham got involved at that time. The first convention was, was I, think, I think it was my idea um, because I've been to some of the big science fiction conventions, world con stuff which have been held in Britain and the British Fantasy Society conventions and I ju it just seemed a natural thing you know when you started the society well why haven't we ever had a Doctor Who convention? You know why has no one ever done one? So I think I went to the exec and you know I, I said I said, you know, why don't we do one? And every, although it might have been me that was the first convention organizer, it was all of us that organized it. Gordon, Jeremy, Jan, Steve, everybody. All the, I, I can't mention everybody who was involved, but we were all part of what made it happen. I was just perhaps, to a degree, the focus of it all. I would say the biggest change is most, most events are not conventions anymore. Most events are basically glorified signings where you have a lot of people signing for money and you'll have a, a few panels as a sort of sop to making it look more than just a signing. Um, I think the wonderful thing about this convention is that it is a convention. Duas has kept the flag flying for proper conventions and, and other conventions like Hooverville you know who do still have a, a, an old style panel as well but I, I think they do fly the flag here I think these these capital events are brilliant well I'd, I'd have to say for me personally obviously my own conventions the first two I organized have to be the highlights because those are vivid memories in my life um, I, I haven't attended many conventions outside of that because it's not who I am I tend to move on when I've done something, I don't. You know, the reason I resigned as convention organizer after the second convention was because I'd I'd done it. I couldn't think what else I could do. Um, I suppose um, having John Pertwee and Tom Baker at the very first convention, Graham Williams, Louise Jameson, Matt Irving, was incredible to actually have them there on stage. Um, the second convention to have Nick Courtney and John Levine and, and John Le Pertwee meeting together for the first time in years were magic moments, you know. And I think for the second convention, you know, we had a props display, we had autograph sessions, we had panels, we had um, two doctors, um, breakout rooms with, with smaller meetings and screenings of episodes. I thought, what else can I do? And when you think about it, apart from photo studios, nothing has changed since. That is what conventions are. So I think I probably did the right thing to stop. It was the 40th anniversary goal of the first convention um, this last year. Um, and I had to do something to, to mark it. So it, it, it just seemed like the right thing to do to arrange a reunion of as many people as I could get who were at the first convention. Uh, at the church hall where we held it and I thought rather than making people pay to come you know which meant that a lot of people wouldn't come why would they I don't think you could organize the event unless you turned it in a com into a full convention and then you change the whole point um, I thought best thing is pay for it myself real time to actually run it and organize it make it just a big un reunion when everybody can have a big conversation and chat go down the pub afterwards and if anybody wants to buy a copy of the DVD of that where everybody's reminiscing, they can. It's what I do, so it made sense. I worked at the BBC and then at Channel 4. Um, and while I was working at Channel 4, I went to what is, was their BBC Worldwide, um, which was just called Business Development. Um, and I worked there for three years doing, um, working in sales, working in marketing, more on the technical side of providing all of the copies of all of the programs. But I also worked with all the legal team and everything. And when I left Channel 4 to set Real Time Pictures up, it was with the intention of making programs which we own the rights to, which Real Time kept the rights to. Because probably the biggest downside of being an independent producer, for the most part, is that you normally sell away all your rights. You know, if you work for Channel 4 or the BBC, you don't normally, unless you're a big company, you don't keep your rights. Yeah. They take them. And they give you royalties, but they basically take the program rights away. And so it was always the thing for me, it didn't matter how big, if we worked on micro budgets, if we kept the copyright to what we did, it would build a portfolio that would bring us in money for, you know, for ad infinitum. 
So that was the premise that when I started Real Time, as well as doing corporate and business work. Um, and we eventually started doing Myth Makers because it just, again, seemed self-evident why wasn't anybody doing this now that video was available? Why wasn't anybody doing interviews with actors and actresses from Doctor Who or from science fiction programs? Because it made sense. And this was before the days of the BBC doing it. You know, uh, and I, I, I can't say I thought at the time I'm breaking ground here, but you look backwards and you think, oh yeah, I was. I was doing something no one had done before. You know? And 135 myth makers later, we're obviously doing the right thing. The main reason that we were here today um, was one to help Tony and the guys out because you know I'm still I'm still part of Duas um, to record all the panels for them as a record, um, but also um, in exchange the society has always been absolutely brilliant helping us to record MythMakers, and we've managed to do uh, four, five, five myth five MythMakers um, over the weekend. Um, my, I, I won't go into a complete list, but my two highlights are having Katie Manning interviewing Stuart Bevan in the TARDIS and interviewing Scott Tracy, Shane Rimmer. You know, two huge ticks. And, you know, I, I'm, I live a blessed life. I really do. What, what else can you want to meet your heroes and, and make, make, make videos with them? The next drama we're in pre production on now is Anomaly, um, which, as most fans know, um, to a degree, one might say there are two Kate Lethbridge Stewarts out there. There's the one that we created, um, and there's the one that BBC created. Um, one can argue over copyright to the ends of the earth, but there are two Kate Lethbridge Stewarts, and that doesn't make sense. So Anomaly will resolve that issue. I think Dwight still has a huge place in Doctor Who fandom. You know, it, it's difficult in these days of uh, internet, of uh, social media for uh, any organization to have a relevance but if there's one truth in being a fan of anything doesn't matter if it's Doctor Who, uh, um, EastEnders, whatever you want to meet other fans, you want to spend time with them, you want to meet friends, you want to socialize which is what it's all about and that means conventions and apart from the information because you can argue that information can now be gleaned from anywhere I think the primary focus of Dwas is and should be now bringing fans together because that's what fans value um, and, and these conventions prove that Dwas still has a value.